To be polite, video game preservation is an absolute dumpster fire. Unlike other mediums where works of art and video games are art, damn it, are well preserved and will probably outlive everyone watching this, unless you've figured out something I don't know, game releases aren't quite so lucky. It doesn't matter whether it's a critical darling that sold like gangbusters or a forgettable bargain bin piece of trash nobody remembers anyway, any game can find itself on the chopping block and no longer able to be acquired by, let's say, conventional means. That goes double for online only games as well, whose servers can be shut off at a moment's notice. This sucks no matter which title it happens to, but it doubly stings when a great release is suddenly pulled, leaving it locked behind overpriced secondhand shop shelves. I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com, and these are nine more amazing video games you actually can't play anymore. Number nine, The Matrix Online. Yeah, yeah, I hear you out there saying, Josh, I thought you were talking about amazing games on this list, but The Matrix Online is a piece of trash. And to that I say, no, stop that. The Matrix Online was actually good. It was really good and it was fun. And you're wrong, probably. Or maybe I am, but it's good. It might be difficult to remember now, but the Matrix movie franchise was never supposed to be the main vehicle for the IP. When the sequels were concocted, the Wachowskis wanted the story to live on in a variety of mediums, including video games. The Matrix Online was part of this initiative, a canon adventure that would continue the story via players occupying the role of Matrix operatives working alongside the likes of Morpheus, and it was a good laugh. It launched in 2005, and despite the muted reaction to the two films and other game tie-ins, managed to find a player base to survive the always rocky first few years of an MMO's life. However, it wasn't to last, and by the time Sony decided to shut the game down in 2009, the title reportedly only had about 500 active players. In a stroke of genius though, the shutdown was marked by a major event. With the Matrix program in-universe going completely haywire, everyone getting superpowers regardless of their level, and a final note of not like this being sent out to players before the simulation was shut down for good. Number 8. Warhawk Warhawk is far from the most popular game on this list, but the fans it did have were damn dedicated. Sony's exclusive multiplayer game was an ambitious achievement, allowing players to jump into vehicles, take enemies out on foot, and fly through the air engaging in dogfights across huge maps. It was that latter part which stood out the most though, and being able to hop into a jet and chase after other players gave the PlayStation a multiplayer experience that the competition didn't have at the time. In a lot of ways, it was a little bit like Battlefield's more open modes, or maybe a proto-planet side, mixing a whole bunch of combat types into one volatile cocktail of player interaction. The limitations of the PS3 meant it wasn't the prettiest game, but it certainly had its charm. Of course, because the release had no single player component, its servers being shut in 2019 killed it dead. It was a decent run for a title of its age, and it's a testament to the dedication of the player base that it lasted as long as it did. Number 7. Transformers Devastation a lot of the Transformers games released over the past decade or so have been weirdly good. High Moon Studios had their own little enterprise up and running before they were folded into the Call of Duty machine, but while those games were the most notable tie-ins the franchise received, they weren't the only ones about robots in disguise worth playing. During the weird period in their history where they were taking on pretty much every project under the sun, the devs at Platinum Games found time to craft a project based on this series, titled Transformers Devastation. Station. With a lush, cell shaded art style and fantastic combat, as you'd expect from the devs, the tie in proved just how much untapped potential there was in the IP. Of course, you know how this story ends by now. Activision and Hasbro's deal concluded, and a whole host of Transformers games, including Devastation and High Moon's output, were delisted. Number 6. The Godfather The Godfather tie-in game shouldn't have even existed, never mind being as good as it was. This was a movie adaptation 40 years after the fact that was clearly trying to use a recognisable name to cash in on the open world criminal mayhem that was proving so popular for Grand Theft Auto. And yet, it was way more than just a soulless product. 
You took control of non-movie character Aldo Trapani, working up the ladder of the Corleone family by pulling off petty crimes, keeping other families in check, and overall just trying to get as much real estate in the city as possible for your bosses. It had a surprising amount of depth though, and while a lot of the actions were repeated, there was always an interesting way in which you could gain power and take it from your enemies. The real selling point though was that this was a faithful adaptation. It took place within the world of the Godfather movie, and actors from the film even returned to reprise their roles, to varying degrees of success, shall we say. However, it didn't exactly sell well, and a sequel a few years later didn't convince EA to stick with the franchise. And once the licensing deal was up, both titles and their DLC became unavailable. Number 5. Battlefield 1942 even though Battlefield is a household name now, it took a good while before the series reached Call of Duty levels of popularity. Before Bad Company introduced console players like me to the shooter series properly, DICE's brainchild dominated the PC space, giving players an all-out war experience unlike anything else. It was Battlefield 1942 that really first highlighted just what the series was capable of though. Launching in 2002, the World War II shooter took conflicts from across that period and used them as the backdrop for huge huge multiplayer battles between 64 soldiers. In a lot of ways, it was essentially the same game that DICE is still making today, and that led to a huge following at the time, and it even received a console sequel slash reimagining years later in Battlefield 1943. Due to the age of the game and just how much the franchise had progressed since those early days though, support for it was stopped after GameSpy, a company which provided matchmaking middleware for a bunch of big multiplayer titles, closed down. Number 4. The Lord of the Rings The Battle for Middle-Earth Lord of the Rings doesn't get as much focus when it comes to the world of licensed games as the likes of Spider-Man or Batman, but it was subjected to just as many video game tie-ins of, again, very varying quality. Battle for Middle-Earth was a genuine gem though, a solid RTS experience that fully captured the scale of the conflict central to the source material. Especially at the time, the epic nature of the films wasn't easy to translate to the gameplay of a third-person action title, but it was perfect for the strategy genre. Sadly, this was one of the Lord of the Rings tie-ins EA published during the tenure, and when they lost the license in 2010, it suddenly became unavailable, though there are some unofficial servers still floating out there. Consequently, while this entry is specifically about Battle for Middle-Earth, it might as well stand in for every Lord of the Rings game that's been scrubbed unceremoniously from history. The multiplayer Conquest, the Lego games, the goddamn Return of the King game, oh my god that was awesome, they've all been pulled at one point or another. Someone get Peter Jackson on the phone stat, surely he can sort this out, I just want to play Return of the King without spending £20 on it. Number 3. Guitar Hero Live when the new generation came around in 2013, the big publishers all dusted off legacy series they drove into the ground a few months prior to try and inject some new life into them. Guitar Hero was one of these franchises that was rebooted for the new machines, and while it was easy to laugh at the awkward FMV presentation and the Be A Real Rockstar marketing campaign, Live was a damn fine installment. With a retooled guitar that gave even GH Stringsmiths a new challenge to master, the bones of the new game were as strong as ever, but the real draw was the Live playlist mode dubbed GHTV. This was an online suite that let players jump into music channels, all playing a selection of new songs that would be constantly updated by Activision. At one point, this reached about 500 extra tracks, which absolutely trumped buying individual tunes in the franchise's rival rock band. But sadly, this would hurt the game in the long run. Guitar Hero Live didn't sell well, and Activision shut off the online servers in 2018, suddenly making those 500 tracks instantly inaccessible. You can still pick up the game today and play the regular 42 songs, but the real experience will forever be lost. Number 2. Marvel vs. Capcom 2 the Marvel vs. Capcom games before the surprisingly feature-sparse sequels came along anyway are proof that any mad crossover can actually work as long as there's a good game to support it. Where Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe failed to properly sell players on why they'd want a game where Superman beats the snot out of Scorpion, fans quickly took to Capcom's fighter and it became a fan favourite on the fighting circuit. The second game is arguably the peak of the entire franchise though, boasting a great roster, gorgeous visual style and tight spectacular combat. Sadly, playing that version today is complicated at best and impossible at worst. 
That's because for a while, Capcom actually did a pretty good job porting the game over to new consoles. The publisher has released versions and everything from the PS3 to iOS, which isn't too shabby for a game that came out in 2000. Sadly, in 2013, Capcom and Marvel Comics' licensing agreement came to an end, and MVC2 was caught in the crossfire, leaving it unavailable on a whole bunch of consoles and Steam. Well, I mean, look on the bright side, at least we've got Marvel vs. Capcom 3 and Infinite to play. Yeah... good. Number 1. Deadpool I mentioned in the last video I did on this topic that just about every Spider-Man game made by Activision ended up being pulled following the publisher losing the license a few years ago. But that actually extended to pretty much every Marvel-related game the company got their hands on. Deadpool, however, suffered a fate worse than most, as it actually got delisted twice and at the time of writing remains inaccessible. The tie-in was a little rough around the edges, but its blend of melee and ranged combat made it a surprisingly fun actioner, while the character's signature humour was present in spades, right down to how the developers chose to present things like QTEs, which the character would comment on in-game. It was pulled in 2016 after enjoying a re-release on next-gen consoles, probably to capitalise on the new film, but showed back up on Steam and the PS Store later that year, but only in American territories. The revival didn't last long though, and the game was pulled down once again in late 2017. So that's our list, I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below, are there any games I missed off this or the last list, and while you're down there, could you give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to whatculture.com for more lists and news like this every single day. Even if you don't though, I've been Josh, thank you for watching, thank you Return of the King, the video game for existing, and I'll see you soon, bye.